Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm joined again by Dr. Danny Faulkner, and we're going to be talking today about specific heat. So we did a whole episode, Amazing Water, Specific Heat, talking about some of the things that water does for our planet. So I want to just give a quick refresher about the importance of water as an amazing design God has given our planet. Well, it takes a lot of heat added to water to change its temperature. You have to keep putting it in and putting it in. And that's the reason why they say a watch pot never boils. It just seems to take forever. And that property makes it very good for uh, heat control. We can use it for heating systems, cooling systems. The radiator in your car, for instance, uh, cools the, the system, uh, keeps it from burning up the engine by taking the waste heat away. And climate, mm -hmm. it makes a big effect there when you're near the ocean, time, uh, temperatures are, are milder. So it's a really a great design uh, factor that God's built into yeah. the world around us. One thing I don't think we talked about in the other episode was geothermal heating. Mm -hmm. So we actually drill deep pipes down into the ground and then pump water down where it will pick up the, the heat from the ground, bring that up into your home. Now in the winter time, the air temperature is going to be cooler than it is below ground. And in the summertime, that's reversed. So we can use that latent heat inside the earth to cycle that and give us heating my, and cooling. My, my father had a system that, that did that. Instead of trying to uh, extract, uh, put hot, uh, you know, extract heat from the house and putting it outside where it's already hot, yeah. it exchanged with underground. But you know, if you live in a place where they have um, uh, volcanic activity and you have hot springs, uh, they pipe like Iceland. I understand most of their buildings are they have pipe natural stuff in and heat that and the, right and the way you and the way you control the heater is to open the window. <laughs> Don't worry about the pill because they're not paying any money for it. And I was in a place in New Zealand where I had a lot of geothermal. It was a park there, and people had a creek running through their backyard with water just boiling up, and people could take pots and put it into the into the stream mm -hmm. and cook dinner. Yeah. Where I grew up in southern Idaho was a large volcanic flow area. We had lots of natural hot springs in that yep. area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the activity that you're going to be doing today is going to be based on this concept of specific heat. Now, specific heat is the amount of energy that it takes to raise a substance by one degree Celsius. So we're going to talk about an experimental design today and the ways that you can be a good scientist as you're working through this activity. So the basic supplies that you're going to need are very simple. You're going to need two plastic cups. These could be like the disposable plastic cups or anything like that. You're going to need a block of wood. And this block of wood only needs to be big enough that the cups can sit on it. The block of wood is going to kind of act as an insulator from anything around it. And you're going to need a thermometer or two. If you have two thermometers, you can actually put one in each cup and it'll be easier to monitor things as you're working through. If you have a digital thermometer that you might use in the kitchen, so I smoked a brisket this last weekend, and I used that thermometer to check the heat, you could use anything like that. Uh, but it's gonna work best if you work in Celsius temperature. If you've got a Fahrenheit thermometer, no problem, but I'll have instructions on how to do that conversion there. The other thing you're gonna need is a little bit of sand, enough to fill one of these cups about half full, and it doesn't, it won't take much, and some water. So we're gonna actually measure out the different amounts of sand and water on a scale. So you may have a scale in your kitchen or a way that you can do that. If you don't have that, it's not super essential. You're probably still gonna get pretty good results if you use about equal amounts. But we wanna to try to control all of the variables in this experiment. So in this experiment, you're gonna be putting a thermometer in sand and in water and leaving it on the sun and looking at the rate of heating. And then in the evening, after the sun goes down, looking at the rate of cooling. So, so see, this take... needs to be done on a clear day at yep. night, mm -hmm. and also probably in the summer rather than the winter. Yes, it would work better if you have higher temperatures over 75 degrees or yep. so. Not essential, but it'll certainly give you better results if you can do that. So why would it be important to use the same amount? And now when I say amount, I'm going to talk about the same mass of sand as water rather than just using equal volumes. Well, keep in mind, we define specific heat in terms of the amount of um, heat per temperature change per mass involved. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to make that comparison, it has to be equal amounts of mass. Yeah. When we did the experiment earlier, it was a brick and some water that had the same mass. Yeah, so right when we there. did this experiment with the brick and the water and the episode, we had 196 grams of brick 
and so I used 196 grams of water approximately. So when we think about differences in experiment, we call those variables. So the variables that I'm trying to keep the same all through the experiment are called my controlled variables. So I don't want to use two different cups. Why not? Because one might be different substance, might be styrofoam and aluminum, plastic, okay. different things. The weights or masses might be different. Mm -hmm. So you want, to, you want to keep that the same. So the only thing that's different is what's going on inside the cup, not the cup itself. Okay. So in a really good controlled scientific experiment, there's really only one difference. Mm -hmm. Now in the real world, <laughs> we never get quite exactly there. But our goal as good scientists is yeah. to try to limit those variables so there's only one variable that we're manipulating. Okay. So we've got a controlled variable. There are two other types of variables we need to talk about. We need to talk about the independent variable and the dependent variable. And these are kind of um, counterintuitive ideas yeah. in some sense. You may not have run across this idea. So let's use this little acronym I've got here on this poster to explain this, okay? So this acronym is dry mix. So when we think about this acronym, the dependent variable is our result, okay? It's the thing that we're going to be measuring and taking um, some reading of. We don't know what's gonna happen. It's dependent on what we're doing. So we could also talk about this in terms of cause and effect. So in this case, the dependent variable is the effect, the outcome of our experiment. We think about down here, the MIX acronym, okay? the independent variable is the one that we get to manipulate. We're going to change that. So if I were to do an experiment, like over here when we talked about the brick in the water, I tried to keep everything the same, but I manipulated one of those variables. That's gonna be my independent variable. I changed the substance that was there. Okay? Tried to keep everything else the same, and we measured the temperature changes that happened. Okay? Yep. So dry mix is a good way for you to remember which of those is which. Now when you think about that in um, any type of calculations and things that you're doing in the lab, trying to measure different things, why is it important for you to understand what your variables are? <laughs> which is the independent, which is the dependent? Well, hopefully one thing, you're gonna change one thing or allow one thing to change, and as it does, it will change something else. Mm -hmm. The most common thing I encountered in the physics lab would be uh, time. Okay. We let time go by, and we're gonna have objects we're measuring the speeds or positions of, mm -hmm. and it's gonna change. One time it's gonna be here, another time it's gonna be there. So um, <clears throat> we say that the time is the independent variable. It, it's all by itself, does its own thing, time marches forward, no matter what we do, we can't control that. Mm -hmm. But the position or velocity of the object would change according to time. The so temperature you would actually do the same thing. measure the distance an object moved yep. in a period of time. And so what you're measuring, the result would be your dependent variable. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we could have done the same thing with the lab we did in the in-class demonstration when we had the brick and the water. We could have um, you know, had a stopwatch here and every, every five seconds recorded the temperature. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the temperature is 23.0, and then it's 24.1, and so forth. And that would be the independent would be the time, and the dependent would be the, the variable would be the uh, would be the temperature. Yeah, and oftentimes as we're dealing <clears throat> with these things, we're going to get some mathematical relationship between those. So, for example, when we think about speed mm -hmm. or rate, we get rate equals distance divided by time. And those would be the dependent and independent variables as we're measuring those things, depending and, on which one we're trying to manipulate. And the math is not your enemy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know people get upset with math. They get really excited and get really, really worried. But it, it can, it's your friend. You're supposed to work with mm -hmm. it. It's a tool. You shouldn't be fearful of it. And uh, science, we, we deal with these kind of mathematical concepts all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we think about these variables and the way that we're um, manipulating them and changing them, we're often going to want to see a visual representation of those things. And that's where we come into using a graph. So I've got here on this card a picture of the temperature data that, we, uh, that I took as I tested out this experiment to make sure everything was going to work well. I'm not going to tell you which one is which or which one <laughs> goes where. but. From this, um, from this dry mix acronym that we can use, I know that my dependent variable is the result that I'm going to measure, and it's going to go on the y-axis. So that's the uh, vertical axis over here. And that's the temperature. Okay. And then over here, we're going to have 
the independent variable, the one that I manipulated, and it's going to go on the x-axis down across the bottom. And we can plot those out and graph them over time. Now, I cheated. I actually put this into a spreadsheet and let the spreadsheet make the graph for me. But that's a tool that scientists use all the time to analyze and, the data. And over the past 45 years, I have plotted by hand an incredible amount of data that I collected. Um, I'm pretty good at it. I've, I've spent many, many hours doing it. It's a mm -hmm. good exercise, yeah. and I still even do that today. Sometimes and if I just have a little bit of data, it's more trouble to write the program sometimes <laughs> than it is to just go ahead and plot the data. Sure. Three or four points, I'll just grab a piece of paper. Yep. And, and just kind of rough it. out a If I got 100 sketch. points, I'll take the time to write the program. Sure. So. And then a lot of uh, spreadsheet programs would have those things built into them. You can select a data set I, and it'll Either one will work, graph. though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we think about data, that word we've been using, um, how is data defined? How would we think about data in an experiment? Well, generally, it's a quantifiable measurement mm -hmm. of something. You measure temperature, you measure mass, you measure speed, a position. Anything you can measure is, require, is usually referred to as data. Okay. Even sometimes observations. So if I were Candy. a biologist, I would watch the way a bird moves or things, the way it walks. We and can use I, those as data And, and a student well. of mine might look at the moon every night for two weeks and mm -hmm. record its position, the sky, draw, draw what it looks like. It's, it's going to be data as well. It's, it's a collection of things, observations mm -hmm. you've made or measurements you've made. But now, as long as our senses are working and our equipment is working, if we're using things like a thermometer or temperature probe, does data really change from one experimenter to the other? It <laughs> should not. It should not. <laughs> However... <laughs> Uh, you have uh, biases that come in. Uh, people, uh, I'm aware of people who found data in what we call noise, just, just random mm -hmm. stuff there. There's always a, a little bit of random variation in your measurements. Uh, the way you read the temperature, the way you make the measurement of time mm -hmm. or length or whatever, uh, that has a little bias built in, just a fuzziness involved. You can't, you can't parse it down too accurately. Yeah. And uh, also on top of that, weird things happen. <laughs> they do. Uh, I, in my observations I do in astronomy, we have some very, astronomy, we have some very sophisticated equipment, and sometimes we've got some data points that are just going dink, dink really nicely, and all of a sudden, bam, one way off the scale, and we have no idea what happened. Yeah, and we typically <laughs> call those outliers. Yeah. So the data should be repeatable and mm -hmm. verifiable between different observers or um, experimenters. Because it, it isn't totally repeatable. No. That's why we repeat experiments again and again yes. and again and again. We, we don't want to do an experiment once and quit. We want to do the experiment repeatedly. Yeah, and then maybe in, have another person try it. So if I were to take a measurement of the temperature of this room using this thermometer, mm -hmm. and that would be a data point I could plot, mm -hmm. and then we could come back at some other point and plot that. If you read the same thermometer... Or a different thermometer. Or a different thermometer, you might get a slightly different value. Yeah. Because, because we might not look at the gradations the same way. You yes. might look up or down. And being trained in how to read these scales on different tools is important. And in, as a chemistry instructor, that would be something I would do for my students. I'd teach them how to read this. So this one is graded by one degree measurements. And so I would read this to the nearest tenth of a degree. And we talk about significant figures in our calculations and how that tells us about tools. If I told you that the temperature in this room was 26.2493746.2 degrees, <laughs> what would you tell me? Uh, you're, you're blowing smoke. <laughs> okay, so that would be bad data. I've given you too much information. But oftentimes we'll take our data and oh, yeah. we want to analyze it. So data is just gathering the information, then we analyze the data. So we could do things like taking an average or a median, the mode, all those types of different statistical analyses. We could do things like t-tests and chi-tests and that we do in statistics with numbers. Why are those things important, especially you talked about outliers a second ago? Well, they can help you uh, figure out how good this, the fit is. That's an important thing mm -hmm. that I always did in my work is, and my students as well when I was teaching at the university. As many times I wanted to know, uh, we have an R value on a linear fit. How mm -hmm. good does it fit? If you've got a few outliers, you have a problem. So you want to get some ideas of your errors involved. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're going to try to measure something like the acceleration of gravity or the conductivity of a piece of metal or something. Well, you want to know uh, how good that is. It's a certain value plus or minus so much. And those yeah. statistical packages help you tremendously in doing yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So if we think about this graph that I made here of my temperature data, we could actually plot out using the point slope formula, y mm -hmm. equals mx plus b. We could look at this data and we could come up with what we call a line of best fit mm -hmm. that best approximates the data here. And I can see that line with my eyeball. Yeah, that line would just be kind of lining up 
those the, points. Your, your plot's connected them dot to dot, so the best fit of this red one would kind of split the middle, some above, some below. Mm -hmm. Ditto for the blue one. It would be like, run across through this one. This one's a little high, I can see. Mm -hmm. So your line would run below it, but probably above those, this one over here. Mm -hmm. So that would be analysis of our data. Yes. And everybody would do the same type of analysis and come with that. Now here comes the tricky part. Now we've got to interpret the data. So when it comes to interpretation, we typically think that is the step where things can go wrong. Why? <laughs> well, because the interpretation, uh, people can sometimes make mistakes on things. Uh, they can assume things that aren't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about um, specific heats we did before. We had densities is another one. I had my students measure various densities and then I go like five or six things and I give them an unknown. And the unknown was a, was a, was a weight and uh, I would give them the weight and they would try to figure out it's 50 gram weight and figure, get its density then go try to figure out what it's made out of. And I was fooling them every time because this was a <laughs> nickel plated uh, uh, weight but it was copper inside, copper or inside. actually brass inside. Yeah. And so uh, they almost never got brass. They, uh, they would say, well, it can't be brass. It doesn't look like brass. Well, that's because it's nickel-plated. I very rarely had a student get that one right. Man, I'm, isn't it I'm, fun I'm being jokester. a teacher? That's, that's the best part of being a teacher is to pull those tricks on your students. So they were looking for molybdenum oxide or something. And I just I'd make it simple, folks. Just look, <laughs> look it up a small table. What's stuff the here. value? Yeah. Yeah, what's so that's the value? where the analysis can lead you astray. And many times it's the biases that you have. This case they were they were going by what it looked like not mm -hmm. by what the data were telling them yeah. actually. We often talk about the difference between historical science versus empirical or observational science. So if we're measuring the specific heat we should all get the same values and be able to do those things but even in observational science interpretation can be an issue yeah. and we can we can come into some errors. Yeah. But when we move into historical science and we're looking at we're applying those scientific things to things that happened in the past for instance, you work a lot with stars. Mm -hmm. So how might the historical um, science interpretation really be different based on your presuppositions or your worldview? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking, we're looking at the way the star looks today. Mm -hmm. But then people try to, to guess in the past what the star was like in the past. How did, how did it get to be the way it is now? And that's where you get in historical science. And I can you can make a set of assumptions that will lead you in a certain direction, but are those assumptions correct or not? We don't know. We don't know what the star did a thousand years ago or 10,000 mm -hmm. years ago. Nobody knows. And I, I think in astronomy many times they're looking particularly at how things came to be. Mm -hmm. And they, they so really err on that one. I if think. you start from an evolutionary bias, your interpretation is going to be influenced by yep. that. And we need to be aware of that. And we all need to know that we all have biases yep. as we look at the data and interpret. But in this kind of science, I hope it, that doesn't come yeah, to Yeah, this should come out. We're not worried about where the sand came from. <laughs> no. <laughs> or how old those, those grain, the sand grains are and, and what their source was. Okay, so when you run this experiment, we hope that you are very careful. We want you to be the best scientist that you can be so that you're reporting your results back accurately and honestly. So in science, we want to do that. So throughout the day, you're going to measure what the temperature is yeah. and into the night. Yep, so we're going, to, we're going to set up these cups with the thermometers in them, or you can change the thermometer back and forth if you need to. And you're going to measure the heating period. And if you've got all day, you can let that sit through the day and record those temperatures every hour. And then in the evening when it's cool, you can let them cool down and measure those temperatures for another two hour period. So two hours of heating, two hours of cooling, and then you're going to graph that data and see if you can and interpret those And you want to pick results. out an area at your house where you don't have a bunch of trees where it'll be in shade part of the day yeah. and at night. Mm -hmm. And after it starts, sun goes down, keep them in the same place. It's yep. very important. Yep. Trying don't to control all those variables. Be as good of a scientist as you can. And when I think about that from my perspective, I want to do that because I want to reflect God's character in my work as a scientist. He's a God who is truthful and faithful and, and does everything the same way every time. I want to reflect that as a scientist. And so when we think about science, we're not setting God aside, are we? No, not at all. And we definitely want to bring him into this and glorify him by understanding these things and how they work and even applying them to all types of different circumstances and situations. All right, we well, hope you'll have fun with this experiment and learn a little bit more about specific heat. And until we see you next time, get out and explore all of God's amazing creation.